How are you? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. This is the second time I got to meet you. The first time was on the rope line at the Paley Center in 2017 when the show was just being announced. Yeah. And I know, I just, one of the many faces sticking a microphone in your face. <laughs> on Twitter, so I feel like I know you better than, <laughs> better, more. Oh. We've You're met. so sweet. Thank you so much. I don't so, know. I with a ring light. Oh, <laughs> someone's sending me one as a gift. I was like, wow, that's very generous. They're amazing. Actually, this one was a gift from Wilson Cruz. Oh, he's the best, isn't he? I love him. The love of my life. Don't tell my husband. Oh, that's where I want to pick up because that's where, uh, that's what's changed since, well, a lot of things have changed, but the biggest thing that's changed since I spoke to you last was Noah. And when I read the New York Times write-up of your wedding, Oh my God, tears. Oh, really? Oh, it was so beautiful. And you know, that line about, I am tethered to you even when I'm apart. <laughs> Honestly, like I'm, first of all, I'm so sorry. My cat is freaking out right now. <laughs> Please, my son. Um, but that like, that day was like literally the best day of my life. And uh, it was so magical and, uh, I don't know. I'm just like so glad we got to do the article because it just like kind of like crystallized it in time. And I'm so glad you liked it because oh, they did a great job. So happy about it. So much fun Star Trek stuff too. Yeah, that's a, it's so informed. And you know, the fact that um, it, it showcases how you got this part. And of course it's because of your talent and your skill, but a little bit of sprinkling of Trexy, Trekkie dust, thanks to <laughs> Noah and his mom. Definitely, definitely. No. Those who haven't read it, would you mind telling that story about um, the audition and how he helped you prepare? Oh yeah, so I had an audition for Star Trek and I knew Noah was gonna just freak out. Well, first of all, our friend who went to Juilliard with us, Mary Chifo, had already been cast. Um, so baby, please, you've gotta shut What's your cat's up. name? It's okay, she can meow all she wants. What's her name? It's a Sphinx. Sphinx. He thinks this is like the playroom. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I have a dog who has interrupted almost every Zoom call I've done so far this week, um, but he's locked up in a way in a bedroom. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I got the audition. I already knew Mary was on the show, which was like very exciting. We love Mary. Uh, and I told Noah and he was so excited. And he was like, well, you have to nail the techno back bowl. You have to. It's like such a large element of the medium. And so, uh, as it still is today, it was very difficult for me. Um, just like not a science-minded person, so it's just, it's just, it's just like pure rote memorization a lot of the time. And I think I got one take where I nailed it, and he was like, "That's the one." And he read with me in the audition and everything, so he was very, very involved. Um, and then uh, when I got the part, which kind of fell out of nowhere because I auditioned, and then. A week later, they asked me to slate, which is like a thing in an audition where you just like show up, show your whole body to, so mm -hmm. they can kind of get a sense of you visually. It's very um, terrifying. Yeah, sure. Being judged by your body. Yeah, it's uh, it's really uh, rough. Um, but uh, I was wearing this like literal like hippie dress with like holes in it everywhere with like my hair huge. And I was like, okay, babe, can you do a slate for me really fast? And he was like, absolutely not. You can't wear that. Get something with squared out shoulders. Try to find something that's like at least a little military feeling. Um, and we did the slate. And then I think a month later I found out I got it. I never taped again. I never went in for like a producer test. It was, it was insane. Like that doesn't happen. It was so, I was in a play at the time. The play closed. I had to fly up to Canada the next day. It was like- You also had just moved into a place in Brooklyn, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it was like this <laughs> crazy whirlwind. Um, and then the best part was when I finally got to tell his mom, who was just so over the moon. I mean, she's just full of love. She's like classic Star Trek person, just like fully like present and emotional, great person. Like, and she just wept. I mean, she was just knocked out. And it was, um, it was a really special moment that was only beaten by when we told her that Noah was gonna be in the series, which was now, great. How did that come about? Cause I've, I've seen Noah's pictures. I know he's, well, I think the word that Anthony just used last week was nerd. You're a nerd, he's a nerd, you're all nerds. But he is like me, he went to the conventions, he dressed up, how did he get this part? And it's not nepotism, I'm sure. No, no, he had auditioned for stuff like independent 
me. I didn't even know he had gotten the auditions, but um, but I think <clears throat> he auditioned for something and he didn't get it because he wasn't quite right for it. But at the time, Alex was like, just so you know, we Alex were- Alex Kurtzman. Alex Kurtzman, yeah, right. thank you. Um, we were very impressed with his work and we're kind of keeping an eye out for something for him because we like him a lot. And so I was really excited, but I didn't want to get his hopes up. Um, but then when Rin came along, it was just perfect. Um, oh. And uh, he worked really hard for that audition and he nailed it. I mean, he killed it uh, and he got it. I mean, totally on his own merit. I was so, so excited for him. And he's already part of the family. So everybody else was so excited for him. Um, it was just like really, really nice, wholesome family moment. <laughs> That's fantastic. I am just thrilled at your story. I'm thrilled at the story that you're telling on Discovery and I wanna to get to that. But let's just backtrack. Since we're on the subject of Noah, how did you and Mary and, and Noah all meet? How did this all happen? You mentioned Juilliard. Yeah, so yeah, we, we met at Juilliard in 2011, I think. That, that was our first year. And it's a very um, intense conservatory program. So we started out with 18 kids, both people fresh out of high school and people who came as a grad program. And you're kind of thrown together. And then for the next four years, you spend almost every waking moment with these people. Um, you do play after play and you're just, you're there for 12 hours a day. Um, and you get, it's kind you know, it's kind of its own kind of family. So we all got really close. Um, uh, and Mary was always kind of like, for me, like I felt very protective over her uh, cause she came in uh, straight out of high school and she was young. Uh, um, she always felt like a little bit of a little sister to me. And then me and Noah started dating in my, in our third year while we were doing Our Town. Um, oh, I love you. I love her. I love her. <laughs> <laughs> it was very romantic. <laughs> and That uh, line, that line. Oh. Yeah. And Mary being your little sister, there's a stretch, huh? <laughs> it's so funny, like, um, just Mary and I ending up in this franchise, but also it, it's funny because personality wise, it feels like we we would each be more suited to each other's characters. We've talked about this before, like Mary kind of is Tilly. Really? In a, I mean, in person, in real life? Yes. I mean, she's so full of life and energy. She's so sweet and so empathic and kind. Um, and for a long time was still trying to find her voice. I mean, she's found it now, like she yeah. is, an amazing warrior woman um but it she, she has that tilly thing to her so much and i can be much more of like a protective mama uh fierce you know uh aggressive um so maybe a bit more like laurel um but i always thought that was kind of funny we ended up in the same show playing each other's characters <laughs> now um as far as um your background in acting um this is not your first role, obviously, but is it your favorite role? Because it is so different from who you really are. Yeah, um, it's definitely the role that I've spent the most time in. So I probably have never like had such a deep relationship with a person I've played because mm -hmm. of time and I love her and I feel very protective over her. Well, the fans feel the same way. I have been just bombed by fans saying, when are you gonna interview Tilly? We wanna hear from Tilly. We, and I'm like, um, her name is Mary. <laughs> but you know, it's sort of like they associate Sylvia Tilly with Mary Wiseman. And also I noticed your Twitter, by the way, is May Wiseman. Is May the name you use sort of, you know, with friends or is that just because of Twitter? I have like one friend who used to call me May Wise and uh, I made my Twitter so long ago. I'm just, <laughs> could have like gotten a publicist to like do that thing, integrate. <laughs> Your social yeah, media, but I know. I, it's just a bad Twitter name. <laughs> I, I, we, we are in the same club because mine was from my blog I made in like 2010 when I started thinking about coming out as trans and I wanted to call it life after dawn because I was projecting that someday I would have a life after I transitioned and now here it is seven and a half years later and I'm still life after dawn on Twitter and people are like what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know it, it, it's, it's established it's there whatever. Um, Okay, so here's the thing. I wanna give everybody a warning. We're going to spoiler territory because you've made the episode a year and so ago. I saw the episode and last week 
um, we found out you're in the mirror universe again. And that's a big change, but you get to kick Sonequa in the face. <laughs> what was that like? Um, it's crazy. I was excited to like, I was excited to play a badass, you know? It was, it was so fun when I saw it was coming down the pike and also that I got to do so much in the mirror universe. I was so excited. I also know that like, Killy is somebody who's very important to a lot of fans, especially like my curvy women out there who like to see another full figured, fat, curvy, chunky woman get to embrace our embrace our size, as I always say. Exactly. Get to wear something powerful and use that size to command authority. Um, so I was also just very excited for the fans, first of all, because there's more options for cosplay now because she changed her hair. That's right. <laughs> and second of all, just to like kind of get to dig into it. You don't always get to see a woman like me in that sort of position, you know, like psychotic <laughs> murderer. <laughs> Is Kelly different in this um, current season three than she was in season, um, I think one or two, I can't remember which one, right? Season one. Oh, right. Well, it's interesting, like, because in season one, I only really got to play Kelly as Tilly projected her. Right. It was so, like, it was a pretend t Killy, right? Right. And so it's like, well, how much of that has to do with the real Killy? Like, how much was she able to tap into and and how much is different? And so I just, I tried to, I mean, I was definitely informed by that section of season one, but I also tried to build her from scratch a little bit based on the circumstances of this like fascist world they all live in like surrounded by genocidal maniacs um uh and i i don't know i kind of tried to build something a, a little different it was it was tricky but it was a really really fun and satisfying challenge and i'm happy with how it came out like there's a little like azula from uh avatar the last airbender in there <laughs> there's a little harley quinn um oh absolutely I think that in a world that's so repressed and violent, violence becomes these people's only outlet for like pleasure and release. And so I kind of, I don't know, that's kind of what I was playing with. It was so fun. I mean, it was just so fun. <laughs> so um, Anthony, I talked a lot about how working with Michelle Yeoh was just a treat. And you got to be in many scenes in these two episodes side by side with Michelle. What's she like? And what is it like working with such a legendary actress? Um, Michelle is like, she just like exceeded all my expectations for what she would be like. Obviously I was incredibly intimidated. She's a legend and she's an incredible actor, but then she also has all these other skills on top of that, like her body and her physical language and her fighting and you know, how it's like dance, it's just, it's all just like on this level that I've never encountered before. So I was very, very intimidated meeting her, but then you meet her and she is like the kindest, most outgoing, chillest, coolest person on earth. She's always like bringing you little snacks or taking you out to dinner and like getting the extravagant, beautiful dinners and drinking the best wine. She's just like the coolest, coolest woman alive and I was like I was so honored to like have gotten to know her and then to get to work so closely with her on these mirror episodes I mean I just kind of tried to watch her and soak up as much as I could and and learn something because Michelle is someone who commands power with very little effort um and I was really interested in that and she's so so different than me I feel like uh there's a lot for me to learn there. So I just tried to take it as a teaching moment. And I just enjoyed every moment I got with her because she really is just a legend and cooler than you could even imagine. I can't. I, I have to uh, vibe off your word there about power because back when you made season three, Tilly goes through a transformation of her own in the universe that we all live in, in which she is thrust into a power role that we didn't see coming. I mean, some of us saw coming, but what was it like for your character and for you as an actor to have this new responsibility and to project that? Um, especially because I, I think Tilly season one would have run into her room and, and cried. And season three, Tilly's really stepping up. Yeah, um, it was interesting. I uh, There was a learning curve because 
Well, I have like certain skills as an actor, but I wouldn't say like stillness or power or leadership are any of them. And Star Trek has been a really good opportunity for me to like learn what those aspects of humanity are about and why they're useful. Um, and I kind of had to learn with her, like, how do you take on this position that both within the world of the show and within the real world, not everybody is gonna think you should hold? Um, and how do you stay strong within that um, and lead? Um, and I had some interesting moments on set, Tunde, who is like, you know, just kind of the heart of the show in, in a lot of ways, our executive producer slash director who has directed some of the most fabulous episodes of our Absolutely. show. Absolutely. So talented. So talented, so visually intelligent and a very kind um, and measured person. Um, I had a day on set where something had happened, like Tilly had received some sort of blow and I think I was playing it a bit wounded. And he came up to me and he was like, I just want you to be a bit stronger. And I was like, okay, but I, I have to be true to this, this feeling like this wound, otherwise it's, it's not real, which is like very important to me, like the, the truth of the emotional experience of it. Mm -hmm. And he said, I've been in situations where something very scary has happened. And because I'm in a leadership position, what's most important is that I prioritize a projection of strength so that everybody else um, can feel safe. And that's what being a leader is, is sometimes you do have to subvert your own experience in order to support the experience of others. And that was, an, it's, it, I mean, that was an incredible direction. And the fact that he took that time to talk to me about that, I feel like that's a lesson for my life as well as for the acting of this show. And I, I learned something just about what it means to be in Starfleet, what it means to be a leader um, and what it means to take care of people and be strong. You know, and I, I'm really grateful for that lesson. And I think you can see that in Tilly, how she learns to take up that mantle and interact with people in a bit of a different, in a different way without sacrificing herself, because that would be no fun. <laughs> as far as fans go, a lot of fans have asked me how much of the character's lines are something that you may have contributed or is everything scripted? I mean, everything's scripted. Um, yeah, everything's <laughs> So I wouldn't even begin to try to take credit for any of like the classic Tilly lines. I will say that like some uh, some writers let me have a little bit of freedom in exactly how it comes out because so it can have that like kind of Tilly bumpiness and stuff, which I find very, very generous. But um, I have to give credit where credit is due. This is the work of a lot of brilliant minds behind the scene who really crafted Tilly and I follow their lead. You know, they don't follow mine, I follow them. After talking to, um Ian and Blue and Tig and Anthony. I just want to say to the producers, it's nice that you let the straight people also be part of Star Trek. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've got you've got five, at least five out LGBTQ people on a fantastic dramatic series. And that that alone is is incredible. But to have such representation, it means so much to fans like us. Yeah, I'm so glad. It's so important and uh, this is the world, you know, like this is what the world looks like. This is the world coming into focus. And this is a real representation of who should be at the table. Like this, like, you know, like this company is not very different than the company I hang out with in, in my private life. So why shouldn't that be on screen? You know, and, and the stories are so much dynamic when they come from that level of authenticity of experience. Um, and actually get to touch on the whole realm of lived experience, which I think is what Gene Roddenberry wanted in the first place, is for all the dynamics of, of, of life and experience and identity to be represented on screen and discussed and explored. So it feels very right. Um, and I think the show reflects that, like how strong the stories are when they tell everyone's story. Of the, uh, of the group I just mentioned, um, like you, we follow each other on Twitter, and I follow Wilson, but we've only met once, and this was back in 2015 on an LA rope line. And I haven't seen him in person except for that 2017 Paley premiere. And I just wanted to get a sense, what is Wilson like? I mean, we both love him, but what's the real Will? I mean, my God, what a hunk of a guy, what a sweetheart of a man. What's that guy like? I mean, Wilson is like the kindest, loveliest, soft-heartedest, 
person. I, I love him so much. He's somebody I talk to constantly and I go to for support and who, you know, seeks that in me also. I mean, he's just like, he's a friend. He's just a good person full of love. And yes, he has a very beautiful container, but what's inside is even more stunning. Um, I just, I love him so much. And one of the great gifts of Star Trek is letting him be in my life. I mean, and you can, I mean, he's so intelligent and the way he can synthesize information for people to make it clear is like something I constantly admire him for. And he never misses an opportunity to talk about how Star Trek reflects the actual world and the things we're actually dealing with now. Um, people who are still vulnerable, uh, um, issues that would have gone unspoken. Wilson always makes sure to address those things because he feels an, a responsibility to his community and to the greater world. And I, I mean, I just, I look up to him a lot. Well, I hope you're a writer in some form because you have such a wonderful vocabulary and a way of words that I could just basically run your entire interview and I'll take the credit with the byline. <laughs> are, are you a writer? Uh, I write for pleasure. <laughs> I could see that. And I, I, I would love to read what you write. Um, I, well, if you're into short poems about birds, Dawn. Oh, uh, I love poems. Poetry is wonderful. It's one of my favorite classes from college. Okay. I have a friend. We always we always laugh at each other. Um, it's our birthday. Is you know I I I I'm old. I'm old. I wear my trousers rolled. J. <laughs> Alfred Prufrock, you know, and uh, goes and, the sky while the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half deserted streets. I memorized that poem when I was seven. Oh, and my my favorite was at our wedding. Um, I'm a widow now, but. At our wedding, she read, um, nobody, not even the rain, has such small hands. Which, you know, it brings me to tears just thinking about it. It's just, poetry, poetry centers me. And it gives me this um, sort of like beaming out of reality kind of thing where I get to sort of be in a place where I can look back and, and look forward. Yeah, it's like, I totally know what you mean. It's like, it's like you're walking along and suddenly your foot like sinks into the earth. Like there's this deep stillness and profound aliveness within poetry that is so important to check back into. It's like prayer, you know, it's like- It is, it is. So I, feel, I feel the same way. That's so beautiful that, 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 that you read that poem at your wedding. That's so beautiful. I love that too. Yeah, I love E.E. E. Cummings. Um, so oh, I, I have, what, I'm sorry? It's well, Ian's, right? Sphinx has gone around. Before Ian and Blue, Star Trek has always had a character that young fans could like latch onto. In Star Trek season two, they had Walter Koenig as, as Pavel Chekhov. In Star Trek The Next Generation, we had Will Crusher played by Will Wheaton. And at Discovery, it was pretty much Tilly. The young, fumbling, oh, I don't know what I'm doing kind of character, but she's not that anymore. Do you think you sort of passed that mantle on to blue? I think so. And I think it was a good time for them to come in. And I don't think that Tilly could have grown the way she, she did without somebody else coming in who could take up the like kind of newbie still learning role. And blue is so talented. Um, it's so funny too. And, and, and they really have a great um, uh, self, uh, idea like uh, I think that they've evolved into that yeah I do think that they have an incredible sense of humor which I hope people get to see more and more but like good night gents is like 100% blue and I've really grown <laughs> I didn't have, know that. <laughs> oh, yeah, have a very similar sense of humor and we've gotten to work together a little more um and I'm just like totally enamored with them and they're so talented uh and what's amazing about blue Playing Adira is that they are in the process of enormous self-growth and enormous becoming. And we get to benefit from that on Star Trek because we get to watch their, their journey that they're actually living. So it, it bears so much authenticity to that story. Um, and it's just kind of like amazing to watch them blossom. And I mean, they're gonna be a huge star. So it's also just like good, like, you know, maybe they can get me a job later on. <laughs> I said, that's all the young people I hire. I said, I'm hiring you mostly so you'll hire me someday because, you know, uh, um, 
I, I'm, I only have a few minutes left, but I, I did want to ask you, um, without giving away all the things that you're doing now in season four, holy crap, you're season four. Um, can you give us an idea of, of um, where the show is going? Because I know that in the episode that's coming to viewers this week, uh, there's a setup for another series for section 31. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that turns out, but the discovery is going to be in this far flung future. And I just wonder how does that affect your character and how does it affect your role? I think that the, the jump to the future forced Tilly to grow in the way that we're seeing right now leaving behind everything and processing that grief, but also kind of having a chance to turn the page has been incredibly good for her. And I think a lot of what Saru says to her is really prescient that like- Oh, Doug Jones. I mean, can we just take for a moment? Doug Jones, when I saw The Shape of Water, tears, tears, because he just brought so much to that role and he does it weekly now with his voice too on Star Trek Discovery. What he can do through that mask is extraordinary. And like, nobody can do what Doug does. And nobody, you cannot imagine how hard it is, what he does. Like I couldn't do it for an hour, let alone every day for decades. He you spends know. hours getting into that. Uh, and then he can wear it, which means he can't really go to the bathroom. He can't really eat or drink. He has to wear those shoes, which are painful and a bit scary to wear. Like he is operating on a level that I don't think people even know. And then through that to have such sensitivity. And I mean, he really is uh, an incredible artist and I'm very, very uh, proud to know him and be his friend. But I interrupted you as you were talking about how Saru's character how does the character of Saru um, is uh, helping Tilly grow in the 20, uh, 32nd century? 32nd, I think we're at. That sounds right. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think what he says about her blossoming during this period is, uh, is kind of right on the money. Um, sometimes in super stressful, uh, dangerous situations, that that's where we reach uh, can dig in and reach different parts of ourselves because we have to, because it's necessary. And I think that happens for Tilly. And also Colbert has a line um, to burn him at one point where he's, he talks about this idea of post-traumatic growth. And I think that Tilly is in a process of post-traumatic growth right now. And I think she's becoming in a really beautiful way, but in a different way than she was the first season where she was so green. I think she's really becoming an adult right now. I have looked forward to this for so long. I don't want it to end, but I know we only have a limited time. At the end of every interview, I ask everybody I ever ask questions of, is there anything you wanted me to ask that I didn't ask? Is there anything that I missed? Anything you want to say that I should put in my article for our readers? If I have an opportunity to speak to something, it's like, I've noticed like, um, there's definitely been like an uptick in like body shaming towards me and Dilly this season, um, which was, harrowing because like I'm a person I have a history and bullying is like totally a part of that so it has been hard and it's really hard to avoid because it pops up on all the you know all the accounts or people comment on my posts with you know cruel unscientific comments and I just want to say that um all the people who kind of step in to back me up like that your presence is like little angels, like blocking out these little trolls. Like it means something to me. Like I see those things and they hurt me because I'm a person, I'm a human being, you know? And to have somebody step in and defend you is really meaningful. And I think people need that kind of thing to heal. I think everybody needs somebody who stands up for you. And to feel that in the fan base means a great deal to me. And I want to do that back for you and for other people who feel picked on or hurt because their body doesn't exactly match what somebody else fucking decided their body should look like. Like I, um, I wanna give that back because that's meant a lot to me. And there've been people who reached out to me and I'm gonna try to reach out more, especially people who are struggling with feeling like they belong because they've been told their bodies aren't, aren't right in some way. I, I wanna give voice to that. And, um, and I just wanna say, I love all of you and 
you're perfect as designed and there's no question and there's no criticism because this is what is and all of us deserve to occupy space whether it's at work or you know out in public or on a fucking starship and i'm proud to be here and i am proud to wear my skin tight costume i'm proud of my body and i belong and so do you that is fucking awesome and i enjoy your words we have a saying in my house watch your fucking language um so <laughs> that's what i tell my children all the time <laughs> sorry I <laughs> Are you okay. I think we know where I think we know where Tilly's uh, F word came from now. Um. <laughs> Swear, I just enjoyed it. I, you, didn't, you didn't write it, but you did enjoy it. Okay, got it. But but amen, amen. You know, I, I often say to people, well, they said, well, you're transgender, you can't have a baby. Why would you care about abortion or reproductive rights? I said because I don't want a man telling me what to do with my body either. Yeah. I mean, I don't want anyone judging my body for what it is. And you know what? Honestly, in 2020, if you got nothing better to fucking complain about than how somebody's body comports, we all are, are we who we are, you know? And I, uh, that, that song from, uh, I'm trying to remember the show, uh, La Caja Fa, I am what I am, mm. you know? And it's often a gay anthem, but I find that really applies to everybody in terms of stop judging, just let it be. I'm quoting songs now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my love to Noah. Thanks. Um, tell him we're looking forward to seeing more of him. And we're uh, excited about you two being together and not so far apart anymore. Thank um, you. And we're grateful. And, and all the hard work you've had to do with the pandemic and everything, I can only imagine what it's meant um, to be an actor. There's so many actors right now who want to do what you're doing but can't because of Broadway being shut down, because of local productions. Here in where I, the town I live, the local playhouse went out and filmed a, a movie because they couldn't stage a play. That's and, amazing. And they put it online. Isn't that great? I mean, that's you got to find ways to, to get through this. And I just hope you and everybody are staying safe and that you have a wonderful holiday season. Um, I'm Jewish, so uh, I'll say Happy Hanukkah to Noah. Hanukkah, we're we're a half Jewish family, so uh, we were the same until I decided to convert. So enough personal no nonsense there, but yeah, it it works. Um, my my son, I'll just tell this little story. When he was three, he said, "Daddy, how about you help us celebrate Hanukkah, and we'll help you celebrate Christmas." And we always celebrated Hanukkah with the kids, but for me, until I converted, it was always, you know, sort of a mixed bag. But um, however it works, it's just happy holidays. Thank you. I appreciate it. And same to you, Don. So good to see you.